Amen. Thank you, James. I want to invite you to take your copy of God's Word, if you wouldn't mind, and turn with me to the book of Ephesians. If you have trouble finding it in front of your Bible, there's a table of contents, two headings, Old Testament and New Testament. Under the New Testament heading, to start in Matthew, you'll eventually find Ephesians. Look out to the side, find the page number, turn to that page number, and then we're going to be in chapter 2 this morning. This morning, as we continue our sermon series in the book of Ephesians, I want to begin by seeing how many of these common phrases that you can complete that you're going to see on the screens in front of you. First of all, if it sounds too good to be true, it is. We make money the old-fashioned way. We earn it. Some of you may be too young to remember that commercial. There's no such thing as a free lunch. There is no pain without gain. And in the book of Hezekiah, you find this statement. Some of you will get that later at lunch. God helps those who... I say that because that's not found in the Word of God anywhere. So let me ask you a question. How do you spell salvation? Now, I don't mean literally how you spell salvation. Let me tell you what I mean. Many people spell salvation by these two letters, D-O. That is, there's something that you have to do to be saved, whether it's be baptized, whether it's join a church, whether it's do good works, whether it's give to the poor. In other words, you have to do something in order to be saved. Other people spell it D-O-N-T. That is, if you don't do certain things then you can be saved and have a relationship with God. Things like if you don't murder, if you don't rob, if you don't steal, if you don't do those things, then you're going to be okay. But I've got on there how God spells salvation. He spells it D-O-N-E. In other words, it's already done. That there's nothing that you do or don't do that Jesus has already paid the price. He's done everything that's necessary for you and for me to have a relationship with God. There are no strings attached to that. There's no fine print in the contract. When you receive Jesus into your heart, God receives you into His family. And I don't know how many people I've talked to through the years in trying to share my faith with them about Jesus. People who are striving, who are straining, who are yearning and trying to earn their salvation when all you have to do is just receive salvation as a gift. I want to say to you this morning, before we kind of dive into the text here in Ephesians 2, that there is only one way to get to heaven. And that is God's way. You may have your own beliefs about heaven. You may fall into the do or the don't or whatever about getting to heaven. But I submit to you that your beliefs are worthless if they disagree with what God says. If we try any other way outside of God's prescribed way to get to heaven, then we will not get to heaven in spite of our sincerity or in spite of our good intentions. Many people are sincere about the direction that they're going, but... They're going in the wrong direction. Culture today tells you and me that there are many different roads that will lead to heaven. Many will say that we're all going to the same place. We're just trying to get there by different paths. However, I want to remind you of what Proverbs 14 says when it says, There is a way that seems right to man, but its end is the way of death. The fact of the matter is there is only one way way that leads to heaven and it is through the cross of Jesus by faith through faith by grace through faith in what Jesus has done and I say that as a lead in because I believe Ephesians 2 is probably one of the the most important passages that you will ever read or study in the New Testament In this text, Paul is going to describe in very clear detail what you were before you got saved or maybe who you are now, how you got saved, 
And then what God wants to do in and through your life after you got saved. Now we're not going to be able to deal in full detail with the entire text in our time together. But we're going to actually look at what I consider to be the two most important words in the text. And it's actually probably two words you might not think of. But it's two words that actually are the title of the message this morning. But God. Our text contains the whole gospel message in actually just six words. And if you know what these six words are and what they mean, then you can know and understand the gospel message. And thus, you can be able to share the gospel message with anyone that you meet. And these, three, these six words are found in three sets of two words each. The first set is in verse 1, the second set is in verse 4, and the third set is in verse 8. They are, you were, that you find in verse 1, but God, that we just talked about in verse 4, and through faith in verse 8. Those first two words, you were, that you see on the screen in front of you, describe our condition before we got saved. They describe not only what we used to be, but they also describe the current condition of everyone in this world who does not have a relationship with God through and in Jesus Christ. That condition, as we will see in a moment, is truly hopeless. Those next two words tell us actually how grace works. That phrase, but God, announces the world's greatest rescue mission. When what we were dead in the fact that God took on human flesh in the person of Jesus to perform the work of salvation so that we would no longer have to be dead, but so that we could be made alive. And the final two words that you see up there found in verse 8 explain how you and I come into contact with God's grace. It is through faith and only through faith. It is not faith plus works. It is not faith plus religion. It is not faith plus anything else. It is faith alone that brings the blessing of God's grace into our lives. And rightly understood the whole message in those six words, you were but God through faith. God made it simple so that anyone could understand it. And with that as the background, I want us to look at the text. I think these first ten verses of Ephesians 2 are probably the most, is probably the most extensive statement in the Bible about salvation. It explains not only how God sees dead people, but it also explains how God saves dead people. So I want to begin by giving you this statement. If you'd like to fill in blanks, now's the time to fill in blanks on your message outline. If you don't, then just act like you're doing it. All right? Here it is. I can best appreciate my present standing before God if I remember my past standing before God. The old saying, don't forget where you came from, can be used of this text. And so let's talk about it. We're just going to walk right through the text. And I have three simple points that I want to share with you this morning so you can remember it very easily. First of all, why grace is needed. Why grace is needed. Why do we need grace anyway? Before we can understand who Jesus is and what Jesus has done, we must first understand who we are and what we have done. And Paul begins here in Ephesians chapter 2. You're going to see it here in just a moment in verse 1. He begins by painting a terrible picture as he's going to describe our condition before we got saved. Or let me add this in parentheses. This may be your current condition right now. Paul's going to begin with our BC status. You know what I mean by that? Our before Christ. Our pre-Christian past. He's going to begin with our pre-Christian past. And the picture that he's going to paint for us is not good. He's going to actually give us the biblical diagnosis of our sinful nature. He's going to show us who we were before Jesus by giving us three descriptors. So 
Who am I? What was my past standing before God? First of all, Paul says, I was dead. I was dead. Look in verse 1. And you were dead in the transgressions and sins. Now, let me state the obvious here, but nevertheless, just so we all understand what Paul is saying. Do you see the word you? Second word. Do you know who that includes? You. Me. You. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. All of us. Do you see the word dead? Do you know what that means? It means dead. And when you put those two words together, what Paul's saying is that you were what? Dead. Now, here's what I know about dead people. Dead people don't do things. They don't decide things. In fact, dead people don't suddenly decide one day, you know what, I'm tired of being dead. I think I'm going to get up and live a few more years. Dead people don't do that. They're dead. Likewise, what Paul is saying, trying to be humorous to drive a point here, you were dead. You didn't decide one day that you wanted to know God. You didn't decide one day that you wanted to get up and live spiritually. You were dead. In fact, this new birth, which is what we call getting saved, we call it the second birth or the new birth. This new birth is just like your first birth. I had nothing to do with my first birth. I wasn't doing anything to bring it about. God and my parents made it happen with no help from me. I had nothing to do with my first birth. Same thing with my second birth. I had nothing to do with my second birth. God did it all from beginning to end, from start to finish. You have to see that prior to your salvation, Paul's telling us here, you weren't in danger of being dead. Paul says that you were already dead. You weren't in danger of God's wrath being upon you. God's wrath was already on you. You weren't sick with sin. Paul says you were dead in sin. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. You were 100% dead as a doornail. I don't know what that phrase means, but that's what you were. And that's the condition of every single person apart from Jesus Christ. Every person that comes into this world is born DOA. They are born dead on arrival. Now, let me say this. Understand, Paul's not talking about being dead physically. He's talking about being dead spiritually. Before you came to know Jesus as your Savior, you weren't sick spiritually. You were dead spiritually. You were physically alive. Yes, you were breathing. You were walking. You were talking. You were physically alive, but you were phys- or physically alive, but you were spiritually dead. Every person without Jesus in their life is spiritually dead. Physically alive, spiritually dead. So if you're here this morning or listening online this morning and you do not know Jesus as your Savior, which means there's never been a time in your life when you've repented of your sin and you received Jesus only into your life to save you, then you're a dead man walking. That's what you are right now. And you don't need resuscitation. You need resurrection. Every person who is born becomes a part of the walking dead. We are all spiritual zombies. And that right there, what Paul says at the beginning of verse 1, and yes, we'll move along here in just a moment. What he says there in the beginning of verse 1 refutes the myth that sin is primarily what we do rather than who we are. You see, most of us see sin as a set of bad things that we do. Like, Adultery, stealing, watching the Vikings. They see it as things that we do. But the word dead that you see in verse 1 shows us that sin is not an action. 
It's a condition of the heart. It's not that we do bad things and that makes us bad. We do bad things because we are bad. In other words, we don't become sinners because we sin. We sin because we are born sinners. On your message outline, let me say it like this. We are not sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. We are sinners by nature. We sin because it's our nature to sin. For example, do you know why your dog acts like a dog and not a cat? Praise God, first of all. Because your dog has a dog nature. Your dog's behavior is a result of your dog's nature. And the same is true of people without Jesus in their life. Just as a dog barks, a sinner sins. No one taught my daughters how to be mean to each other. They were born experts at it. Nobody had to teach them to be selfish. That was just their nature. They were born sinners. Likewise, you know that the saying is true. You don't have to teach children to lie, to cheat, or to steal. You have to teach them not to lie, not to cheat, and not to steal because that's their nature. There has never been a parent who has come to me that has had to teach their child to disobey. Through all my years in ministry, no parent has ever come up to me and said, Pastor, I've got a problem with my child. All they want to do is obey me. Because a child's nature knows to do the opposite. Because we're born sinners. That's our nature. We were conceived in sin. We were corrupted by sin. And we are consumed with sin. And there's one thing, listen carefully. If you don't get anything else out of this message from this point on, listen very carefully. There's one thing that's true of every person who is in this room right now. Either you are dead or you were dead. You see, on your message outline, verse 1 either speaks of my past or verse 1 speaks of my present. So you're going to have to decide which one it is. The second thing that describes our condition before Jesus is not only was I dead, second, I was disobedient. Paul goes on to say in verses 2 and 3, in which you once walked, and I'll explain the numbers here in just a moment, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of what? Disobedience. Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. Notice what Paul is saying here. He's saying that we are in bad, messed up shape before Jesus came into our life. I was, you were disobedient. Instead of following God, Paul tells us, I followed three evil forces. Number one, I followed the ways of the world. Number two, I followed the ways of the devil. And number three, I followed the ways of the flesh. That is who I followed. Those three evil forces of disobedience. So not only was I dead in my sin, not only was I disobedient to God, number three, I was doomed. Paul says in verse three, and we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Because we are sinners by nature, we are born children of wrath. We're not born, contrary to what some people think, we are not born children of God. We are born children of wrath. We must be born again to become children of God. You see, the unsaved person, maybe that's you this morning, the unsaved person is condemned already. The sentence is passed. But right now, God in His mercy is staying the execution of that sentence, giving you still yet another opportunity to repent. Because of our fallen nature, Paul says, being children of wrath, God has passed judgment on us. The wrath of God was upon us. We were as much of the hell-bound system as anyone else, and there was nothing that we could do to escape it. 
God's wrath and His nature was innate. In other words, it was a part of us. It was on us and it was a part of us. We had but one nature and that nature lived for sin. And because of that, God's wrath was upon us. I want to drive this point home. We are sinners. Sinners by nature and sinners by choice. And as sinners, our sin separates us from God because God is holy. In fact, if God turned His back on His Son because of sin, do you not think that He will turn His back on us because of sin? As sinners, we are helpless. And as sinners, we are hopeless. That's bad news. What Paul has just done is he has shown us our grave close. Our condition before receiving Jesus, who we were before Jesus came into our life, we were living corpses. Some of you may still be that way right now. It's a pretty pitiful picture and a nasty place to be. We were dead, we were disobedient, and we were doomed. He's painted a bleak picture, but now he's going to show us how God changes that picture By giving us a brand new canvas. So he moves from showing us our grave clothes to now showing us our grace clothes. Our new condition when we receive Jesus into our life. And it's right here where I want to show you, just in case you haven't already, how you can exchange your grave clothes for God's grace clothes. Point number two. Why grace is given. We talked about why it's needed. Now let's talk about why it's given. We were helpless. We were hopeless. We were helplessly and hopelessly lost. Then Paul mentions two little words. One little word and one big word. That all but guarantees help for the helpless. And hope for the hopeless. So far, we've looked at the bad news, but the bad news is about to get better because of these two words. And I don't know of two more exciting words than what you're going to find in the next verse. The next two words in verse 4 are probably, as I think, the most important words in the entire Bible. Here they are, verse 4. But God. I've just described who you were before Jesus. And I want you to let the force of those words hit you for just a moment. You were dead. You were disobedient. You were doomed. But God. Our salvation hangs entirely on those two words. We can't save ourselves. But God steps in to make that salvation possible. You were dead in your sin, but God. You were living under the control of the devil, but God. You were a prisoner to your passions and lust, as we saw in the previous verses, but God. You were trapped, but God. You were self-destructing, but God. You were separated from God because of your sin, but God. You were headed for hell because of your sin, but God. What a difference those two words make. You may be helpless, but you're not hopeless. Those two little words make a difference between what a person is without Jesus and what a person can become in Jesus. You see, we're not only saved from something, but we're saved by something. What are we saved from? Spiritual death. What are we saved by? The grace of God. Look, I believe the reason why some of you don't worship with passion and why worship is not exploded alive within you is that you have no concept of the depths of depravity from which God has saved you or the glorious love that He used in order to save you. You have no concept of how much mercy God has shown you. You were objects of wrath and yet He loved you anyway. God loved you so much that He absorbed hell into Himself in order to save you. If you could just grasp that, you would not hesitate in your worship of God anymore. In fact, I want you to circle some words for me if you don't mind doing stuff like that in your Bible. The words are these three. Love, mercy, and grace. 
Look in verses 4 and 5. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, and by grace you have been saved. I want to focus on that middle word for just a moment because the motive of salvation is found in that word love. Before you and I could ever respond to God, God first responded to us with His love. We can have a relationship with God, Paul says, because of the great love with which He loved us. In fact, that is why God sent Jesus into this world. You guys know John 3.16? For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. As hard as it is to believe, God did not provide for us a way to be saved because we deserved it. He did it in spite of the fact that we did not deserve it. Please understand that Jesus did not die on the cross because of your goodness, but He did it in spite of Of your badness. In fact, Paul says in Romans 5, but God shows his love for us in this that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God loved us when we were dead, when we were disobedient, and we were doomed. You've heard the saying that love is blind, but you need to know that God's love is not blind. With all of my faults, With all of my failures, with all of my flaws, God still loved me and sent His Son Jesus to die for me. And God loved me even when I was unloving and even when I was unlovable. Now I want you to notice the words at the beginning of verse 5 in Ephesians 2. Because of the great love with which He loved us, even when... God reached out to you even when you weren't worth saving. Even when you were sin-stained and wicked. Even when you were lost and without hope. Look, God doesn't wait until you get better to love you. God loves you while you're still a mess. And He demonstrated that love by sending His Son Jesus into this world to die in your place. To pay for your sins. You see, there are three ways that God can deal with you and me. God can deal with with us according to justice. What is justice? Justice is God giving me what I do deserve. What do we deserve? We deserve hell. That God can deal with us according to mercy. What is mercy? Mercy is God not giving me what I do deserve. It's God not giving me hell. But it doesn't stop there. God can deal with me by grace. Grace is God giving me what I do not deserve. Because of God's mercy, right there in the middle, He does not give us the hell that we do deserve. But because of His grace, God is willing to give us the heaven that we do not deserve. Which leads me to point number three. We've talked about why grace is needed. We've talked about why grace is given. Now I want to zero in on how grace is received. In the next two verses, we discover how God's, how grace is given to us. It doesn't come by works. It doesn't come by religion. It doesn't come by anything else we might conceive as earning God's grace. Grace saves us through faith. Nothing more Nothing less. And verse 8 is the summary of all of this. Look what he says in verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Now you know me. I'm going to pause here and break it down. I didn't say I'm going to break it down. I said I'm going to break down the verses. (laughs) Verse 8. Paul says, For by grace. Very simply defined. Grace means it's unearned, undeserved, unmerited favor. In other words, there's nothing you can do, there's nothing I can do to earn it or in fact deserve it. 
Human nature in us, there's something in us that always wants to add to God's free grace. And it's humbling to admit that we can do nothing to earn our deliverance from sin. But anytime we add anything to grace, we subtract from its meaning. Grace must be free or else it's not grace at all. And I've got some great news. In fact, the goodest news that you will ever hear. Salvation is totally and completely free because Jesus paid it all. You cannot win it as a prize. You cannot earn it as a wage. You do not deserve it as a reward, but you can receive it as a gift. That's exactly what God says to us about His salvation. It's not a reward for those who are righteous. It's a gift for those who will admit that they are guilty. He goes on in verse 8. By grace you have been saved through faith. This is the human response. Faith, or what we call belief. In other words, at some point you responded to the grace of God through faith. Faith is how we lay hold of Jesus. But understand this, faith is not a work. It is a gift. Grace is a gift. Faith is a gift. They're two sides of the same coin. Grace is on one side. Faith is the flip side of that same coin of salvation. Heads is grace. Tails is faith. Grace is God's hand giving salvation. Faith is our hand receiving salvation. Here's the salvation process. Grace is the source, faith is the means, salvation is the result. I also want you to notice how Paul goes out of his way to help us understand that our salvation doesn't depend on us or originate with us. He says in verse 8 and 9, And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. There's one little word I want to zero in on in that verse. It's the second word. Do you see the word this? In the original Greek, it's written in such a way so that it applies not only to grace, but it also applies to faith. Which means not only is salvation and grace a gift of God, even our faith is a gift of God. All of it is the gift of God. Even the faith of ours to lay hold of God's grace, the whole salvation process, even the faith to be saved, is not your own doing, but something that God does in us. Listen, grace is not a reward for faith. Faith is the result of grace. When we get to heaven, we can't even brag the fact that we put our faith in Jesus because that too was God's gift to us. Thus, every part of the salvation process is a work of God from first to last. And so I want you to understand what the Bible means by the word faith. When the Bible talks about faith, it doesn't mean believing in something. It means believing on something. And there's a tremendous difference, but I want to keep it simple. You see, you can believe in a chair and believe that that chair will hold you up. But you don't believe on that chair until you sit down on that chair. When I talk about faith, please understand, I'm not talking about intellectual knowledge of something in your head. Because the Bible says, even the demons believe. Faith is more than that. It's trusting with your heart. It's not enough just to believe that a man named Jesus lived 2,000 years ago. Nor to believe that he was born of a virgin. Nor even believe that he performed miracles. Nor even believe that he died on the cross. Nor even believe that he was raised from the dead. Even the demons believe that. The Bible says. Saving faith is when you take your belief to a point of commitment and you put it on Jesus. You rest it on Jesus as your Savior and your Lord. So let me wrap up. 
I went to great lengths to show you who you were before Jesus came into your life. What precedes that conjunction, but, is not a pretty picture. But do you see how that little word, but, when added to that big word, God, changes everything. Those two little words change everything. It doesn't matter how bad you are. It doesn't matter how much you've sinned. It doesn't matter how much people have already given up on you. It doesn't matter how many times you've failed. None of that matters in light of God's grace. He's able to bring life out of death. He's able to change your life. So no matter how you currently sum up your life and your past, if you add but God... Everything can be different. Now there's another little word I want to add. It's the word if. If you put your trust in Jesus, then what I just said can be true in your life. Jesus died on the cross to change your past, your present, and your future. He's done it all. He's paid the price for your sins. He has the power to change your life. But you need to believe on Jesus as your Savior. So there's a condition, and that's where the if comes in. Jesus will forgive you if you turn to Him. Jesus will change your life if you will put your trust in Him. And Jesus will take you to heaven if you're willing to follow Him. You see, the but God takes care of everything and it turns everything around as long as we do the if part. Because the but God isn't automatic. It doesn't change anything if you don't want what He offers. God's not going to force His grace, His forgiveness, and His goodness on you. It's available if you will accept it. And it's really that simple. It's you simply holding out your empty hands and asking God for His grace. And when you do, you will not be turned away. You see, grace has often been defined as God's riches at Christ's expense. Faith is defined as forsaking all. I trust Him. I hope you've done that. If not, I hope you will. Let's pray. Father, what a text rich in meaning. A text that describes our condition before You. But a text that also describes what You did so we no longer have to stay in that condition. And Father, my hope and prayer is that everybody in this room here this morning has already been a part of the but God experience. And they, through faith, are now saved. But I realize the truth, God, is that not everybody has. And so I pray for those who are listening this morning who have not made that decision. That they will understand that they are dead. Left in that condition, they are headed for hell. But today can be a turning point. Today can be the day of their salvation. And I pray that when this service is over, they'll seek me, one of the pastors out, one of the elders, and give their heart and life over to Jesus. And so, Father, as we prepare to wrap up this service here, we pray that you'll continue to be glorified through it, and that Jesus will be lifted up, and that your Holy Spirit will continue to speak. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Before our worship team sings, I want to 
read the benediction, say a few words about it, and then turn it over to them. So would you stand as we read the benediction together, doing things a little bit different this morning? Benediction comes from verses I did not read out of Ephesians 2, which says, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. I want you to notice the tenses of these verbs are all in the past tense. That means it's a done deal. These are things that God has already done. It's not saying that God's going to do these things in the future. It's saying that God has already done them. He's already made you alive. He's already raised you up. And He's already seated you in the heavenly places. Even though I am down here in God's eyes, I am already up there seated with Jesus. Jesus came to this earth. He lived a perfect life. But then Jesus died the death that I was condemned to die in my place. He absorbed in his life the curse of my death. Jesus satisfied the curse. Justice was served. And now because he shared in my death, I can share in his resurrection. God raised us from the tomb in which our sins had placed us just as he raised Jesus from the tomb in which our sins had placed him. And as Paul says, and we're going to sing about here in just a moment, as Paul says in Corinthians, because of that, Death is swallowed up in victory. Let's sing together to our God.